Welcome to My Comic Shop Book Club. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. This is the first installment of a brand new sub-series within My Comic Shop history. For this first episode, we are going to be discussing Doomsday Clock number one, and I'm very excited to welcome my guest, DC Comics artist, V. Ken Marion. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for doing this and being part of it. Of course. I've been a fan of your show for a while, so it's uh, good to finally be on it. This is, I'm so glad that this worked out and that we can discuss Doomsday Clock together. Yeah, I'm excited. Very excited. So it's Wednesday, November 22nd, the day before Thanksgiving, and the issue came out today, technically the night before, at 11.57 p.m. Mm-hmm. Did you get last night? I did. So I guess kind of to kick this off, it is my comic shop book club. So I thought that maybe to start, we can talk about the comic shops where we where we got our respective copies of the issue. So I got mine last night at the midnight release at All Yeah Comics in Harrison. Uh, I could talk a little bit about that. But where did you get yours? I got mine about an hour ago. Um, I was coming from Brooklyn to Grand Central Station to come up here in uh, Tuckahoe or White Plains. And um, yeah, I stopped at the Midtown Comics at Grand Central, rushed through all the, the tourists and, you know, everyone. And uh, it was actually really busy at Midtown, but that makes sense because it's Wednesday. But I just figured that since it's Thanksgiving, they wouldn't be, but it was pretty busy. So it was cool. Yeah, right on. And I know, um, so it was a different Midtown, but normally Midtown, the downtown location is your go-to spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one that's closest to my house. And it's like, uh, it's near the FedEx that I use when I have to ship pages out. So it's usually like a, a stop in the, the trip, like go to the bank, go to the Midtown, go to FedEx and all that. But yeah, downtown one. Very cool. So yeah, I went to the midnight release party at Oh Yeah Comics, and it was fun. Just a bunch of guys hanging around, chatting about, um, not so much about the issue, but more just other stuff, the movies and TV shows and things like that. Former Alternate Realities owner Steve Odo made a surprise appearance. Oh, wow. I was not expecting that. I walked in. He was actually there ahead of me. He was sitting there with, with the other guys, so I chatted with him for a bit. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. I I never... That's actually my first midnight release. I know these have become slightly more common now mm-hmm. uh, with, with some of these uh, recent event books. But this was the first time that I went to one. It was cool. Yeah. The only one I went to was when the new 52 was starting. They had one at, I want to say the Midtown, not Grand Central, uh, Times Square. They had Jim Lee and Jeff John signing. And I remember I was in the line at like 11, like 30. But the, they said that the line was too big and they were cutting it. And I had to work the next day, so I went home. But then my friend showed up later, and Jeff Johns and Jim Lee were like, no, we'll sign for everyone. It doesn't matter. And I was like, I was so bummed. Because I was there. I was there for like 40 minutes outside in the cold. And then I decided to go home because I'm like, I'm not waiting for this guy. I'll wake up in like five hours. But like, <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, regret. <laughs> yeah. Wow. No, that's really cool, though. And so, um, also, I'm glad that you were able to get the issue. So, you had a little bit of time to read it before, <laughs> before yeah, we recorded. Yeah, read it on the train. It was good. Good reading. <laughs> I f- full disclosure I read this when I got home from all oh, yeah last night it was like two in the morning so um I, I was not out of it but I was a little tired reading it but uh I, I have to say it held my interest and uh, I-, I did have a good time reading it but you know we-, we can get into that I guess before we really dissect this issue I feel like we need to put it in its proper context right so this is the continuation of the story that began in DC Rebirth mm-hmm. the idea that someone that appears to be Dr. Manhattan, has been manipulating the DC Universe continuity and timeline, stealing time from the heroes, uh, sort of an incontinuity explanation for some of the changes that we saw after Flashpoint and in the New 52. Well, well, let me me preface all this by saying that I have zero knowledge about anything that's going to happen in this. Like, like, so I just want to get that out there in front of you. Like, I have, this is like not in any way, shape or form in the editorial group that I've worked in or anything. So I, I don't, I have no knowledge of this. I'm reading this as a fan. So, um, but it's interesting cause it felt almost more like a seek. This first issue anyway, felt more like a sequel to Watchmen than it did to the rebirth book. Yes. Which yeah. is interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a good place to start. And, and just to say, um, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't trying to pump you for any information. Yeah, <laughs> yeah cause yeah. I, I literally have no idea, so. <laughs> but I think, you know, the reason why I wanted to have you on here, um, in addition to, I, I know we'll have a great conversation, but the fact that you are a comic book artist, uh, most recently you've been drawing issues of Trinity, I know you've done Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, you have mm-hmm. more stuff coming up, and we're actually going to do uh, an episode of Flat Squirrel Tales, where we'll really talk more about what you've been working on and your career and all that, but I just thought it would be so interesting to get the perspective of an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, especially something like this, where it's a very specific 
page layout that Gary Frank is following here. Um, mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I, I do want to pick your brain about that in, in a little bit. But, yeah, man, I agree 100%. This felt like it was surprising because, you know, they didn't reveal too much about it ahead of time. Mm-hmm. But the fact that, I mean, it really feels like a tr- like the thing we never thought we would get, like a yeah. true direct continuation sequel, sequel to Watchmen. Yeah. Very, like very much so. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about Watchmen uh, generally? Well, uh, I, I don't think I'm the right person to talk about Watchmen really because I know people love it and I think it's a great book, but it's just, I read it once, I think. I think I've only ever read it once and I read it in college because everyone was talking about how great it was and it was, I want to say maybe like a couple years before the movie came out when I read it, but um, I I didn't love it and it's, I think it's because why I like comics is because I love the, um, like I like that optimistic and like inspirational kind of like what superheroes mean to people and like how you can latch on to characters and Watchmen to me, like it, I just didn't latch on to any of those characters in that way. I like, I know people love it and it's super well done and it's so deep, but it, um, it isn't something that I go back and read. Like, I'm glad I read it, but like, it's, I, it's not something I go back and read and like, Dr. Manhattan and Rorschach and all these guys, they don't mean nearly as much to me as Superman and Flash and Batman and Green Lantern. Like, so I'm definitely reading this as a fan more for the, the DC side of it and less of the Watchmen side of it. But I think it's cool that they're going back into it and using it for more. I know that's some people think it should just like be its thing and that's it. But to me, it's like, I mean, if they can tell good stories, with these guys, they should. I mean, they own them. They should use them as much as they can. And I mean, and, and not like in a, like a, like a crappy way. I think like if they have good ideas and clearly there's, there's something cool here that um, Jeff Johns is doing that they game on, like it, I'm looking forward to it. So I think I had a similar experience. So, you know, I guess my feeling about Watchmen is how can I put this? I respect it and I appreciate it for what it did for the medium more than I necessarily enjoy it. Yeah, I, I feel the same exact way with it. Actually, that's that's a perfect way what you just said. Like, and also we're we're around the same age. I think um, eighty seven, eighty seven, born eighty seven. Yeah, same yeah. age. Yeah, um, we weren't we weren't like teenagers when this was coming out, so it's hard for us to like cognitively think about the comics landscape when this was coming out and how different and mind blowing this was. Because I read this in oh, I want to say like two thousand six or something. So like I had read stuff like like Hush and Superman, Batman, all these like things that in long Halloween and like Jeff, all of Jeff Johns around flash and like all this stuff that I thought was like, this is like so awesome. But like that serious take that, that is allowed on mainstream superheroes now is because of this. So there's definitely like, you have to respect it on that level, you know? Yeah. I, I'm 100% with you. I feel like, you know, the, like, again, putting it in its context and I, I, I do recognize the fact that, I feel like if I, as you were getting at, you know, if I had been reading comics through the 40, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then this came along, mm-hmm. like I could see what a game changer it would be and what it, what it would have been like to read it as it was coming out mm-hmm. and what a departure it was from everything. And I feel like it would have resonated more with me. Mm-hmm. But it's like we grew up reading the stuff that was influenced by it. Mm-hmm. And then you go back and you read, you know, what got the ball rolling. And it's just, I don't know that it has the same effect. Yeah, you know? no, I, I could see that. And I think it also depends on what type of stories you like. I, Based on the podcast I've listened to with you, I feel like me and you are very similar with the characters yeah, that so. we like <laughs> and the kind of stories we want out of comic books. So, and like I said, I like the super optimistic nature of things. And so I love Superman. That's why I love Batman and Flash and Greenland and all these DC characters. So, um, yeah, the the very dark, like like I like to believe at our core people want to be good. They don't want to be bad. So, and I feel like Watchmen, the, what they're saying is the opposite. It's like at your core people like, so it's, it's just something that just doesn't like, it's super well done. It's just not something that I enjoy. Like, I don't like being depressed, you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. and you know, for the record, I know there are probably people listening to this who uh, really revere the story. And, and this might sound like blasphemy to them, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I agree. And it's, I, again, I only read it once. I read yeah. it actually. I think when the movie was coming out, because I wanted to read it first. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually love the movie, by the way. Me too. I actually, this is oh, people are gonna like this. I like the movie better than the book. Like, Uh-oh. yeah, I know. I know. Maybe I shouldn't even <laughs> say that, but I just, I, I mean, I love Zack Snyder, and I know that's like controversial for some people, but like, I, I think he, I thought he crushed that movie. And the things about the book that I didn't like, 
like he like to me he made night owl look awesome in the movie like i that was one of the things was in the book he looked kind of like lame but like in the movie he like he looked awesome so like there's things about the movie that i actually really like and i liked the um the original night owl in the movie like that scene when he's like an old guy fighting and it goes flashbacks to like when he's young like that was like such a cool yeah. like that was like a like a well up your heart kind of moment kind of thing yeah. yeah i mean listen if i look to my right here i don't think you can see it in the shelf but i have the extended super edition of of the watchman blu-ray so i'm oh. I'm with you. I don't know that I, I don't know that I liked it more than the book, but I definitely enjoyed the movie, and I felt that, much like some of Zack Snyder's other films, uh, it got more more hate than it deserved. I mean, it was yeah, totally. Ulti- ultimately, with a couple of exceptions, an extremely faithful mm-hmm. adaptation, maybe to a fault. It might have been a little too faithful. It's it's interesting you said because it it's it's so weird to me when certain things like click with audiences and certain things don't because it's either, Oh, it wasn't faithful enough or it was too fit. And it's just, yep. it's odd. Like, um, like I thought Watchmen crushed it. And the thing with Zack Snyder is that I think he's the only direct, I, and other people may disagree with me on this. I don't know, but with the superhero stuff, like he makes the characters look real and believable, but they also look like they're from a comic book and like, say like, like Captain America in the new movies, like he doesn't look like he came out of the comic book. He looks real, but he doesn't look like he came out of the comic book. Whereas like, like Zack Snyder, like makes them look like they're literally stepped off the page. Like the way they're shot, the way the backgrounds look like, and I know he gets flack for the CG backgrounds, but I think it's like this, this really deep, like, like painterly kind of quality that he brings to it. That like, I, I love his like style. Like I do like, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to get hate now, but <laughs> No, no, it's all good. And again, it's interesting to get your take as as an artist, you know, mm. to get your take on, especially the visual side of it, you know? So, you know, there's there's the whole, you know, we've been talking about Watchmen, and then there's the whole DC Universe piece of this, and Flashpoint, and New 52, and Rebirth. Oh, which I, I loved. Yeah. Loved. And, but before we get to that, so I guess just in light of everything that we just said about Watchmen, mm. when you got to the end of Rebirth, the Rebirth special, mm-hmm. and, you know, Batman finds the comedian's button. Mm-hmm. What was your reaction? Because I was kind of like, okay. <laughs> no, I was excited. I was actually oh, okay. really excited because, like I said, like because I don't like these characters aren't like like holy to me. You know what I mean? Like I, I like I would. I think I'm gonna like them more after this, to be honest with you. Because like I mean, I already like this this the Rorschach character. And this like I think that like I'm I'm very excited to see what Jeff Johns does with it because he's I mean he's by far my favorite comic book writer. Um and like his stuff just like it hits you in the feels you know like that rebirth special dude like okay flash is my favorite character and it's like a mi- like neck and neck mix with wally and barry like i like both of them for like different reasons and for a lot of the same reasons but when wally west came back i was like oh this is sick like and yeah i was so excited about that so yeah it was that was something that i wanted to see for a very long time and he brought it back in like the best way like yeah it was good yeah no again you know very similar path i mean you know for I think really probably our whole generation of of readers I mean like Wally was was the Flash mm-hmm. yeah uh, so I was really bummed when they when they took him off the board and I was really excited when they brought him back in in Rebirth and I remember going to get the issue uh, on my lunch break from work and then I came back and I was sitting there in my office reading it like kind of tearing up a little bit yeah and, you know yeah and I think Jeff in that issue got to the the hard white why i love the flash so much and why i've liked him since i have pretty much started reading comics was that to me the flash has always been about family like that's what to me at its core is what's about and why i like it so much is because like like barry and iris like like barry's like run back from the dead to be with his love you know what i mean that's like there's something like really like nice about that and they they you know and they raise this kid who came came from this like sad home and like they raised him to be this like ultimately like the best hero in the DC universe. You know what I mean? So, and the same thing with him and Linda, and then he has kids and then there's Max Mercury and Jake Eric and this, this whole big family thing. And when they're, they're like, they're like a team and a family that works together and not in like, um, like Barry and Iris never had that, like how Superman, like with Lois and Clark in the beginning, like they kind of try to undercut, not undercut each other, but they're they're in competition. competition Yeah. Yeah. And like Barry and Iris never had that there. They were always like super supportive of one another. And I, I like, and same thing with Wally and Linda and it's one of the reasons why I love those characters so much is because it's just a it's not like a perfect family but like a family that is there for one another and is like just supports one another and like at the end of the day like that is what makes me come back to those characters so much yeah 
I don't know. It's kind of corny, but yeah. No, not at all. I agree. And, you know, in terms of, of Jeff Johns and like that flash run, um, so I, good. you know, I've said this before. I really feel like, so I got into, well, we could get to this in a, in a minute, but I mean, I got into comics with the death of Superman, as I've talked about many times on, on these shows. And so I was reading, I've been reading comics since the early nineties, but I really feel like the early, like the first half of the 2000s, like 2000 to 2005 or so, probably my favorite time as a reader because you had stuff like again like batman hush and uh jeff Loeb on the superman books yeah and jeff john like early jeff johns doing jsa and flash and then expanding with hawkman and you know green lantern rebirth and teen titans and all of that uh greg rucka on wonder woman for the mm-hmm. first time uh and over on marvel too i mean bendis he was doing you know daredevil and alias and ultimate spider-man it was just like looking back on it now probably my favorite period and it coincided with uh, I was in high school. I was working at the comic shop. Like it was just the, the I didn't have a girlfriend. Like this was really where all my energy went. Like, <laughs> dude, same. Like yeah. I, I completely agree. And that's when Green Lantern Rebirth happened too. Like, and that was like, oh, this is so good. Like, yeah, that whole era was like awesome. And they had such great artists working then too. Like, I mean, there's still awesome artists working, but like, like on that stuff, like Jim Lee on Hush and Michael Turner on Superman, Batman, and like, yeah, it was it was like such a good like era for dc like i love that that era was so good yeah no i i oh man it was good stuff so uh so anyway going back to what i was saying you know when they when they had that uh button reveal at the end of rebirth um i I certainly i didn't have any objection um as a watchman purist because i know there is a lot of controversy over over this book at all and it's you know the inclusion of the watchman characters in the dc universe Um, i didn't have any objection on that level uh for me it was more just like Again, I'm not the biggest Watchmen fan in the world, so it was just kind of like, you know, I was much more excited about Wally than I was about the button. But, me too, me too. You know. <laughs> Same exact way, yeah. Uh, speaking of the button, uh, actually, before you came over today, I finally got around to reading the button, the four-part Batman Flash crossover. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was good. I really liked it. Yeah, I liked it a lot too, yeah. Yeah, when when Bruce is able to have that moment with the Flashpoint uh, Thomas Wayne. Mm-hmm. Once I'm going to sound like a like a real softy here, but I was tearing up again when he's telling him, "Don't be Batman." Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I, th- th- I feel like that's probably what Thomas Wayne would say, right? But like, yeah, that's it's crazy. That's a that's a crazy. I I like that crossover a lot. I really liked um, the artist they had that with Howard Porter and Jason Favok. Like that double page spread at the beginning when Jason Favok shows um, Reverse Flash beating the crap out of Batman. Like that was that was really good. Like, yeah. Um, you know, and it's funny. So I like I like Barry. Wally is my Flash, but I like Barry. Mm-hmm. This story in particular, though, I think kind of made me appreciate Barry even more because just seeing that dynamic with Batman, like mm-hmm. two people who are so analytical and uh, you know examining the crime scene and the evidence and all of that, and just kind of that you know that mental uh, matchup there. I really I enjoyed Barry more than than I probably have in, in other stories. Yeah, no, I I really like Barry because he um, before he's a superhero, he's a cop. You know what I mean? And, like, I like that the aspect of, like, before he was given powers, he was still trying to help people. You know what I mean? And so he doesn't need this, like, like, he's not driven by vengeance and he's not driven. Like, I mean, he wants to, like, clear his dad's name and everything. But it's not, like, it's not this, like, guilt that he has. It's, like, just, like, I want to do the right thing. And then Wally's the same way. It's even, like, almost like a more unadulterated version of that where it's, like, just, like, oh, I grew up loving the Flash and I wish I could be, like, like a hero like this and like it's why those characters resonate with me so well because they're just so optimistic and so like they just want to do the right thing because it's the right thing you know right so you know as we move into doomsday clock again there you know there is that controversy there is a whole contingent of fans who really just object to this in principle they feel that watchmen uh, kind of as alan moore has argued should really just stand on its own and not be touched and you know a few years back dc did before watchmen those were prequels so that was you know kind of playing in that sandbox but again not not an actual sequel did you which this is did you read the minutemen one the darwin cook one you know i have it and i haven't read it yet <laughs> that one's really good i've heard that nothing but really, great things really good, i mean yeah. he's one of my all-time favorites so yeah uh, me too me too he's one of my all-time favorites as well yeah so um but i mean on, on that note and you were getting at this before and i agree i think that <sighs> I mean, I, I get the way people feel about that, but at the same time, you know, the the original Watchmen will always be the original Watchmen, and you could pick up that trade, and you can read it, and mm-hmm. it's, you know, a, a story unto itself, and I don't know that anything else necessarily undermines that. Well, my feeling, on, I totally agree with you, and my feeling on this stuff is, like, I feel like, <clears throat> yeah, it, it could be on its own, but think about all these other characters, right? Like, if people had that attitude with say Superman 
he wouldn't be able to fly. He right. wouldn't, Kryptonite wouldn't exist, you know? Like, so, or, or any of these other characters that people have kind of, or X-Men, like what they are, what they were originally in that initial run from Stanley and Jack Kirby is so radically different from what they are now, you know what I mean? Or what they were in the 90s. So, I mean, I think that, <clears throat> like, if they've got a great story to tell and they've got a great way to use these characters, then I'm excited for it, so... It's you know we're in agreement on everything. We maybe yeah. we should have another person here who's <laughs> who has opposite views so yeah, we can really yeah. go at. <laughs> it's just like that's a good point. I agree. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean that that is an excellent point. And I mean I feel like you you know for better or worse you're seeing this with so many things. I mean I'm a huge television fan. I watch a lot of shows. I never thought that I would be watching season five of Prison Break. Mm. I didn't, and I did. Like it had you know <laughs> that show came back. <laughs> So, um, you know, whether it's a television revival or a comic book sequel to something that you thought was forever going to remain untouched, you know, I think it's just sort of, you know, the, the, the nature of these stories and, you know, you can get great things out of it. And I don't know if you don't get great things out of it, then you still have the original story to go back and enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, um, so and, and, and ultimately like the, the, they're, they're doing this because they have like a great idea. You know what I mean? It's not like, like it's like they they want it, they want you to be excited so it's this is like I I think this issue is a good kickstart to it totally because it's like it gets you excited and uses the characters in the right way I think so I'm really excited so let me throw a hypothetical at you yeah. so again you are a working comic book artist you've been mm-hmm. doing stuff recently for DC if Jeff Johns had called you up and had been like Ken like I'm, I love what you're doing I'm getting ready to do this that, new thing it's that, gonna be it's gonna be huge like I want you for it like what is your reaction that would be the dream right there like to work with Jeff Johns on anything like <laughs> that would be the absolute dream so. would there be any because there's like so much I mean there's so many eyes on this like it's a, it's a lot of pressure would you would that hold you back in any way or would it just be an, an automatic like yes like I'm in for this I would work with Jeff Johns on anything yeah yeah, yeah totally on anything yeah um yeah no i I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> the pressure thing, I mean, there's always going to be pressure no matter what. Like when I was working at like, <laughs> like Blue Water, Xenoscope or whatever, like, um, when I, yeah, like when I was working on Xenoscope, like the Grim Fairy Tales, I did like one or two issues of Grim Fairy Tales. Like even that, like I was still like, oh, this is going to be pressure. Like, you know what I mean? So there's always the pressure thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you do the best to block it out. I, I guess it's the same as like what, athletes go through you know like when michael jordan shooting free throws just block everything out so right i don't know same thing gotcha yeah i would jeff i would love to work on anything with you (laughs) that would be amazing (laughs) i would love to see that so all right i mean so let's get into the issue itself it was it was surprising to me how little you know the dc characters were in it uh, I mean, I guess people probably know this if they're sitting down to listen to this, but I mean, we we will be discussing the book, so there will be spoilers. So if you haven't read the issue yet, be, be sure to do that. But, uh, you know, Superman doesn't appear until the final pages, and that's our, our only glimpse into our DC universe. Uh, really, the almost the entire issue is is truly a follow-up to Watchmen, picking up after the events of that. The world is in turmoil. There's a celebrity president who's off golfing while the world is falling apart. There are certain parallels to to what's going on in the world today. We have Rorschach the second breaking mm-hmm. uh, marionette and mime out of prison. I have a theory about who that is. Yeah, what's what's the theory? I think it's the kid who was reading the Black Freighter in the original book. I mean, I, I'm sure everybody thinks that, but and it probably won't be. But like, I, I just think that would make sense. So I think I it, w- it w- well. So he, you know, he takes off his glove, right? And we yeah. see that it's a black hand. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that kind of, that limits the pool of of possible Rorschachs considerably. Right? I mean, unless it's someone who never showed up, and like, like, what if it's like this universe's uh, like John Stewart or something? And you don't know. Like, it could be like because this, this is a. Um, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the Watchmen world is one of the multivert, right? Like, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's one of the parallel universes in the. Oh, sorry. So technically, there should be a, a Clark Kent on this planet, or a Bruce Wayne, or like. Yeah. yeah, so it, it could be any of these characters. Like you know, we don't know. It's so. true. Although I think your gut, I think your gut pick is is the <laughs> right one, and uh, you know we'll find out for sure. I guess as, as the series goes goes on. So you know, Rorschach breaks these characters out of prison, brings them to his partner, who uh, you know it seems like it might be Night Owl, but then of course it turns out to be Ozymandias, mm-hmm. who was responsible for all of the carnage at the end of the original Watchmen. Mm-hmm. And their plan, it seems, is to find God, a.k.a. Dr. Manhattan, mm-hmm. and fix what has gone wrong in the world. I wasn't sure if they were referring to Superman or Dr. Manhattan throughout the whole thing, but then when they did Dr. Manhattan, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. 
So, yeah. yeah. So that's really, you know, the, the bulk of the first issue. And then, of course, it ends with Superman, Clark, having a nightmare about the death of his adoptive parents, Jonathan and Martha Kent, mm -hmm. right? And he wakes up and Lois consoles him. He says, I've mm -hmm. never had a nightmare before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's how the first issue concludes. Uh, what was your take on that, on that ending in particular? And then we'll, uh, we'll go back, but. Um, well, uh, to me, that confirmed that the new 52 origin, I think, for his parents is that stand now with the rebirth. Because I know in Superman Reborn, it's kind of like, a, it's like a, they kind of hybridized the, the two. Right. Or just, so that's how, was, that, that's pretty much what I got from, was that that's the, what happened when he was a teenager. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm ex I, I wonder if Dr. Manhattan is going to be the bad guy. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Cause if he's going to be the guy who messed up the, the DC universe, like I, I just, I don't know if that's going to be who it is. Like, I know I, you know, I'm similarly skeptical cause I feel like it's, it's made, you know, it's made to look like it's him. Yeah. Right. So that makes me think that, no, it'll actually be someone else. Someone else. Yeah. Well, I also have this idea that, see, I don't know if this is true or not. This is just, this is total speculation on my part. We're not but holding like, you to anything. It's all yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like, uh, this could either go 50-50. Like to me, the Watchmen characters could either be the villains of this or they could be like, this could be Jeff Johns like redeeming these characters and like, in, like morally, like he could, he could be making Ozzy Medeiros like, like a hero by the end. Of, like, you know what I mean? Or in Dr. Manhattan, like a, like a true hero. Like, I, I don't know. Like... I mean, it could go either way or, or they could just be what they are and right down the middle and they, you know, they're morally gray when the DC characters fight whoever the, the bad guys. So who knows? Like, right. I mean, it literally could go anywhere from here, but I really like the, um, the idea of the second Rorschach. Like, I think that's cool. Like yeah. the, that legacy aspect being applied to the Watchmen. Like, yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. And so, you know, the, oh, going back to the, the Superman of it all. So, yeah, as you were getting at, there was a recent Superman storyline, Reborn, where mm. it, it kind of merged, right? Mm. The uh, pre-52 and 52 versions of Superman. So, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like this amalgam of experiences. Well, it wasn't that they merged. It was that they were one person, they were fractured. Gotcha. Okay. And then they kind of like got, well, when the new 52 happened, his he, he was fractured into two people. Okay. That's what it was. So, and then the the reborn was them being, like, pulled back together. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it seems like that new 52 origin, at least as far as the, the Kents go, mm -hmm. that's, what's, that's what we're working with at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. So, you know, the book opens, it's, again, a few years after the events of, of Watchmen. It's 1992, which is significant good year right in a number of ways so like i said i got into comics with the death of superman actually just a few days ago i think it was november 18th uh was the 25th anniversary of the release of superman number 75 oh wow okay so you know i don't know it's significant this book is coming out you know 25 years after the death of superman the story itself is set in 1992 the book is called doomsday clock which of course uh, you know obviously Wait, has death multiple of superman was 92? yeah oh wow okay this was that the same year as image as well I think it is. You would know better than I would. I think, yeah. I'm really bad with history stuff, but yeah, <laughs> I think it is, yeah. So, and of course, I mean, you know, Superman, you know, we don't know exactly how Superman is tied into this, but, you know, we saw at the end of uh, the button, right, where the, you know, the button storyline where, um, you know, the button itself is floating and we zoom in on that red and then the red becomes the red in the Superman shield, mm -hmm. right? And of course, Superman's on the cover of this variant mm -hmm. of, uh, of number one and we see him at the end. So clearly, Superman's playing a big role in this, though mm -hmm. exactly what that role will be, we don't know yet. Yeah. I, I, he's probably going to be the, the main character. It was, it was my assumption. <laughs> that would be my assumption, but... I'd love it. Yeah, I would, I would too. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I love that variant cover, by the way. Like, I thought that was the, the regular cover, and you told me it was the variant. But, um, yeah, I love it. I love the new design for Superman, too. Like, because it, it's like a, a nice hybridization of the classic suit and the new 52 suit to, like, and it kind of echoes the movie suit, but doesn't. It looks like the old one. You know, it's like a good clean way to get rid of the underwear but keep them looking like Superman. I agree, yes. Yeah. And I know there are some traditionalists who, you know, miss that underwear. But I feel like this, you know, it's a pretty thick belt. Mm -hmm. So it's as close to underwear, I think, as you know, as you're going to get, and it like it works. I think it's smart to get rid of all the underwear. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, I, I've had this discussion with people, but when I was a kid, like when I was like four or five, I actually didn't like Superman because of the underwear. Like I, I thought he looked kind of dumb with the underwear. Like as like a four or five year old, I thought like yeah, the other characters had like like were kind of cooler edge to them. But um, 
and I, I don't think it because I liked Batman. I think it's just the fact that it was like bright red. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I mean, I got over that by the time I was like, I don't know, like ten or whatever. Like I didn't care anymore. But I think it's a a way to make them look cooler and like more like objectively like the underwear doesn't really make sense like obje- you objectively right. look at it like it, it doesn't really make sense so i think it's smart to get rid of it yeah that's just my opinion though so <laughs> it's you know everyone has their own opinion on it so no i agree but I, I love this cover um you know i know these lenticular covers are huge i i'm not a fan like they're kind of yeah. cool but they just don't really do anything for me i don't know did you get the lenticular trade for the button i did yeah yeah i got that too yeah the uh yeah i I would like them if they weren't more money, but like it's, yeah, it's the, yeah, I, I mean, they're cool. They're cool. I mean, I have to say it's, you know, you're paying a little bit more for this issue, but it's uh, a pretty high production value, right? So you get a thicker cover, better paper quality, no ads, which was nice. Yeah. I didn't even notice that when, when I was reading on the train, you told me there was no ads. I was like, oh wow. Yeah. There wasn't any ads. I didn't realize at first. And then like I, I got to the end. I'm like, wait a second. Like, (laughs) did you read any of the stuff in the back? this like the newspaper clipping stuff i'd be lying if i said i went through everything just yet yeah, i didn't i didn't either I, I didn't read it in the original watchman the, all that text stuff i didn't read i know that's like a big part of it that people that love the book are like no you have to read the text stuff but i think when you read it in trade it um which is how we both read it i'm assuming i think it uh uh it encourages you to blow right through that and not give it the time you know it's, I mean, it, yeah, it is definitely important to the story, but it's, you know, Watchmen's so dense to mm-hmm. begin with, uh, and that, that just adds to it. I mean, it, I mean, I remember it yeah. taking me a long time to get through, you know, yeah. that was not a one sitting read. Oh no, it took me like a week. Yeah. Yeah. Reading it like every day. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this was not as dense, but so, you know, actually, no, now that you bring that up though, I, cause the nine panel grid and everything, um, it's more dense than a typical comic book. Yes. I will say it took longer to read and there was like more meat to it than like normally, which is cool. That was one of the main things that I, I wanted to pick your brain about is that uh, Gary Frank for, for most of this issue emulates the uh, style of the original Watchmen following this uh, nine panel per page layout. I mean, as an artist yourself, I mean, what, I guess just what is your take on that generally? Um, it, it definitely has like a more, it's like, it's a, like a, thicker like slower kind of pace to the book for sure like it it makes things like last longer um and he does follow the grid for the entire thing actually it's not like even when it's not nine it's like it, it follows right. the, the way like the the three tier kind of like breaking things up um which is it's cool because it, we don't really see that in comics anymore and I, I love like splashy art like i love image stuff in Jim Lee, and like that's the stuff that's my absolute favorite and the stuff that's a big stuff popping out and panels overlapping all that craziness um but that definitely has a different pace and rhythm to it than something like this where this is definitely a uh like it, it's 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 all about like the the characters and the emotions and the expressions and gary frank like kills it with the expressions like you can see all the different like you can tell what these characters are feeling like in every panel which is really interesting like which is really well done. That's something that I definitely want to like try to emulate more, like the the expressiveness and the faces. And yeah, I mean he's one of the best. So yeah, yeah, he is great. I enjoyed the run on Action Comics that he did with Jeff Johns a few years back. Mm-hmm. And you know they also did a Superman Secret Origin. Yeah, miniseries, I read it, which I liked, but I'm I'm very partial to Birthright. That's my favorite one. I was going to ask you that. What's your favorite Superman origin? Yeah, and mine's Birthright. It's Birthright. It's hands down Birthright. Yeah. 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 Like Mark Wade and Lenny Yu, like, they killed that. That was so good. What I liked, I mean, oh man, that could be, maybe we'll do another book club episode. On Birthright? I've got, I could talk about Birthright forever. Like, you, you know, funny enough, because a while back I put the call out on Facebook, like, you know, asking for uh, recommendations for book club uh, selections for these podcasts and someone suggested doing a comparison of the various superman origin stories mm-hmm. maybe we'll have to do that at some point because it's like i once again like i respect man of steel and like secret origin was cool but birthright for me i just felt like it did the best job of focusing on the man and explaining mm-hmm. why he puts on the costume yeah more so than the others i totally agree i totally agree i love i love lonely used art on that like it's like it's so not what you think of when you think Superman. Like it's almost like anime looking, which mm-hmm. is like I thought worked so good. Like in the way he draw like the bullets flying and stuff. Um yeah, Birthright is like 
in my opinion, the best. Because it, it takes everything that I think works so good about Smallville and that, like, like who Superman is and makes him so re- makes him so relatable. Like, yeah. It broke my heart that it was kind of pushed aside as far as continuity goes. Not pushed aside, but it... You People know, don't really talk about it a lot. No, not yeah. so much. And, like, Secret Origin came around not that long after. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but as far as, like, definitive tellings of... Uh, you know, Superman's origin. Like, that's it for me. Me too. Me too. It, that is like, that is it. That's the one, if I had like top five books of all time, Birthright. Birthright is my favorite, actually, comic book of all time. Like, oh, really? Like, bar none. Like, that is my favorite. And Hush should probably be number two. But, um, Batman Hush. But, um, yeah, but Birthright, that's such a good book. Like, I, I read that like at least once a year. Like, and I also like that it, it does, to me, Superman... Uh, there's all different takes on who Superman really is. Is he Superman? Is he, you know? um, but to me, Superman is Clark. And like Superman is what he does, but not who he is. Like who right. he is is Clark, right? Where Batman's the opposite. You know, Batman's like, Batman is who deep down who he really is and who he thinks of himself. Whereas like Bruce Wayne's like the facade. Whereas it's like the opposite, right? you know? I've said this on another episode and I hate, I hate to repeat it, but uh, like my take on it is like Clark on the farm mm-hmm. is his truest self. Yes. And then you have Clark the Reporter and Superman, and there's an element of disguise with both. But like when he's on that farm, like yeah. that's that's really who he is at his essence. My take is that, like I totally agree with you. That's that's one of the things. But my take is that when he's on the farm, that's who he is as Clark as well. Like yeah, you know, like as a reporter. Like I mean, because gotcha. I don't like the the bumbling Neither like do take. I. Of Super- I hate Neither that. Do I, I hate that. Like, and I love how in the movies he's not like that. Like yes. in the new ones, like oh, man, because yeah. <laughs> you know what it is. It's like. If you're bumbling, like, like the whole idea is to not call attention to yourself. Yeah, and if you're yeah. just bumbling around, like you are attracting attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you don't want that. Like you exactly. want someone like just a little more unassuming. And I think, yeah, yeah I, I'm with. You. And I feel like we got that. Uh, I mean, we don't see Cavill as Clark a ton. Uh, yeah. Both, in, in Batman v Superman is really the, the only time where you see the disguise. But I feel like yeah. that's like that's the way he should be. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. And like, <laughs> um, if you ever watch the old George Reeves Superman shows from the fifties. A, a little bit not like, a ton clark is like super authoritative in that. like he's like he's like a badass guy like everyone's like they're, they're never like get superman they're like quick get clark like you know what i mean and i think that's a that's definitely a take that i mean probably doesn't work very well in hiding your identity but to me like superman being the farm guy just in the city is kind of how i like to see him more as than like he puts on the glass like i don't really like yeah, I just I just see him as like he's just kind of like a normal guy, and that's why he's so relatable, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, we could do a whole episode on that too. I, I always <laughs> loved on Lois and Clark how there really was there was hardly any difference between his Clark and Superman. I, I was gonna say I actually that's my that's my favorite take on Clark. Is it really? Actually, yeah, because because it's it's the one where he's like he is Clark, like that's who he is, like. And when he puts on the costume, that's more of like a mask. And you're right. There's very little. There, there's subtle. There's subtle differences in it. And I love Dean Cain. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. I'm a big Dean Cain fan, but he's not my favorite Superman. But I'm just saying, like, the the approach to Clark and Lois's right. relationship, I think, is really well done in that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, so circling back to to the issue. Uh, so you know, we talked about the um, this this nine panel per page layout. I'm curious if if they're going to stick with this for all twelve issues. Yeah, I mean. They might. Who knows? Maybe. I mean, I literally have no idea. I mean, probably. Were you, were you surprised and or disappointed by how little the DC Universe characters appeared in this book? I definitely wanted more of the DC characters. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure they'll come. Like, I want to see Wally West pop. I really hope he's in this miniseries. Like, I mean, I I would be surprised if not. So, I mean, kind of just kind of going back and tracking the the evolution toward doomsday clock so i mean not not to get too crazy with this but you know we had flashpoint right where barry went back in time to save his mom he created this alternate timeline and then when he restored the timeline the that resulted in the new 52 where we had uh, a lot of a lot of changes to the continuity a lot of things were streamlined and um you know there were a lot of aspects of characters that were kind of put away for a little while i don't know fans had feelings about that Mm -hmm. and with rebirth it was this idea you know tone wise of restoring more hope and optimism into the books and then i think plot and continuity wise the idea of, of kind of bringing back some of these elements 
Mm-hmm. And you know, I think you see that in, in Superman, not maybe not most of all, but I think it's it's very prominent there. Where um, you know, again, he's married to Lois, and they have the child, and it's um, very different than the New Fifty Two version that we were working with for a while, where mm-hmm. they had really stripped away a lot of those elements that I feel made him human. Mm, okay. Uh, but in any event, so, you know, the, the return of Wally is really, you know, what kickstarted this in, in Rebirth, and we had the button and everything, and, and leading into this. And so, you know, as far as how and to what extent and to what end the DC Universe characters and the Watchmen characters are going to collide, I mean, that, you know, that remains to be seen. So far, we have this idea that someone, again, presumably Dr. Manhattan, but I agree, maybe there's another force at work here, mm-hmm. stole time. That when Barry fixed the timeline, it wasn't just Barry's... Um, uh, workings that resulted in the new 52 but there was actually another hand there that was messing with Which, with history that was in flashpoint by the it way was, yeah that we, was like i think uh, i went back and read flashpoint <coughs> sorry excuse me um and when he buries in that montage when he's like running and pandora i think is in the background she's actually talking about these other villains like these these this other group that's like affecting things so huh. yeah i i don't i'm again i've that I think people kind of gloss over that, but that was in the original Flashpoint. So, who knows if this is all the plan all along? I know it makes you wonder. <clears throat> it really does make you wonder. You know how how much of this was in mind when they did Flashpoint and when they did the New Fifty Two. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but uh, I mean, so what else about the issue uh, stood out to you? Uh, let me see here. I mean, the new Rorschach was probably my favorite part. Like seeing, like, because I thought they were just gonna bring him back. And like, I was like, cause I actually can't remember who was alive and who was dead at the end of the original watch. Cause it's been so long. Cause, but I know Rorschach was like, it, like, like, yes. like, like Dr. Manhattan, like, uh, vaporized him. Um, so it's cool to see the new one. I like how it's a new character and I, th- I think it's that kid. I really do. But I think that's a very safe bet. Yeah. I mean, as far as, again, like I know, you know, we're not, uh, we're not in love w- with the original Watchmen necessarily, but I'm curious, you know, reading john's take on these characters like does it feel like alan moore's voice like the voice of the characters does it feel different um i mean it's been so long since i've read the original one that I, i'm not sure if i'm like qualified to <laughs> to make an assumption. i mean i i enjoyed it like yeah. I, I didn't think anything felt off like in the the rorschach kind of cadence he had you know right but if it's a little bit different that's okay because it's a different character you know exactly it's a new guy so yeah. yeah, this is, you know, it, it's interesting. So, you know, we talked about Jeff Johns and, you know, he's certainly someone I followed for a really long time. Again, that or that early work of his in particular, all those runs that I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. are some of, I mean, they're my favorite work of his, but they're some of my all time favorite runs. Mm-hmm. And not to say that I dislike his more recent stuff, but those, those runs in particular um, really just are favorites of mine. And it, it's interesting to, to see him take on something like this where, I mean, it's a super ambitious project and... It, you know, definitely, a, uh, I feel like a darker take than we, and it, appropriately so, given the characters in the universe that we're working with, but I feel mm-hmm. like a much darker story than we would normally see from a Jeff Johns. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm excited to see where it goes, because it's, yeah, it's definitely a different flavor than we've gotten from him before, so. But yeah, you're right. The, the his, <laughs> I've never been let down by any of his stories. Like, they've always just, like, knocked up from Aquaman to The Flash to the, the new Two Justice League, and Green his Green Lantern run, man, is like... So good, like. All right, this is where we diverge a little bit. Ooh, a little bit. You don't, oh man, Green Lantern Rebirth, one of my favorite stories. Mm-hmm. I love it, really love it. As far as the run that followed, like I liked it, and I loved the idea of the different, uh, you know, the emotional spectrum and the different cores and all of that. Mm-hmm. It got to be a little bit much at a certain point, though, for me. Like all the different colors, and they were always switching rings, and I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, get, I lost I can, a little interest as it went along, but I love the idea of it. I, I mean, I could see that, but like I, his run is why I think Hal Jordan is one of my like top three favorite characters. Is because of like that run, and like in my head, like that is Hal Jordan. Like how he characterized him. Like none of the, none of the stuff before, like. I like even touch like it's like that is like to me like that's Hal Jordan and like I, I don't know how other fans think about that um because I feel like we're 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 kind of old now I'm not sure if you didn't notice that or not but I feel like there's a lot of kids now who probably grew up with that being like in the past you know what I mean so yeah um yeah like well here's a good example like I know 
when the Green Lantern movie came out. And I mean, even now people talk about how, oh, Jon Stewart should be in the movies because everyone knows Jon Stewart from the cartoon show. I'm like, that cartoon show is almost 20 years old. Like, I think yeah. that there's a whole generation of kids who've never even seen that cartoon show. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's it's weird to grow up and see this stuff like move away. Like Rebirth is like, what, 12 years? Green Lantern Rebirth was 12 years ago. It's crazy. Like Hal Jordan's been back as the Green Lantern for like 12 years or so. It's not... You know, we'll, we can get into this more when we record our Flat Squirrel Tales episode, but as I was, uh, you know, reading past interviews and stuff that you've done, you know, reading about how Hush was one of the things that inspired you to do this professionally, yeah. and I'm like, that just came out, and then I'm <laughs> thinking about it, and I'm, see, I didn't feel too bad, because I know we're the same age, so I'm like, all right, I don't, but like, thinking about it, I'm like, no, that was... Yeah. It was, was early in, 2000s, right? 2002-ish? I was in ninth grade. I didn't start with the beginning of Hush, either. I started with... It was the issue where he fights Ra's al Ghul. It was the one right. where he's like in the fire on the cover. Yep. And like, it was like, that's like almost where the end of it too. But I was just like so blown away by like the art. Cause like I had just started getting back in the comics kind of tangentially with like X-Men and Spider-Man more like on the Marvel side actually. And I was reading wizard magazine and there was this whole article about like, who's hush, the mystery of hush. And I'm like, Oh, that Batman looks cool. Like, cause in my head, Batman, it was like George Clooney and Val Kilmer. Like he was kind of like, I always kind of thought, up to that point, I always thought Batman was kind of lame. Like, I thought, he, I thought, I always thought Robin was cooler and Nightwing was cooler and Batman was kind of like the, like, stodgy, lame, like, guy. But when I got hushed, that just, like, it was like, oh, my God, like, Batman's awesome. Like, it just kind of blew me away. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, you know, it, it's awesome. But it was just so funny because I'm like, it just came out and then I'm doing the math and I'm like, no, like, it really has been, you know, it's, it's been a long it's time. It's been a while, yeah. But, I mean, I got into Batman with No Man's Land, which was a few years prior to Hush. Never read it. Oh, it's good. It's yeah. what was interesting about it was that it was this year long storyline, right? Where Gotham is decimated by an earthquake and the government is just like, it's a no, you know, they designated a no man's land and it's cut off from the rest of the country. And, you know, villains are running the city and then Batman and so the few good people who stayed have to kind of wrestle control back. It's really cool. It was this year long storyline that uh, encompassed all of the Batman titles at the time. Mm -hmm. But what was cool about it was that unlike the way they did the Superman books during the Triangle era, for example, with, with No Man's Land, there was one creative team for each story arc. Mm -hmm. And that story arc would cover multiple titles, but it was still just one creative team. So oh, wow. arc to arc, you had a lot more consistency. Um, but so I got into it with that, and then I stuck around. That was when Greg Rucka and Ed Brubaker were on Batman and Detective Comics. And it, was, it was a great time. Like I, I enjoyed that a lot. And then uh, Loeb did Hush not long thereafter. So I was there from the beginning, and... At Alternate Realities, where I worked, we used to have our, our picks, like Anthony's pick, Steve's pick, whatever, and I made Hush my pick for the entire, the entire ride. Entire I liked it year. so much. <laughs> I just, I was like, oh, that's it. No, so, Hush is great. So I'm with you. Hush is great because it's also like, like, I'm sure Jeff Lowe was thinking of this when he was writing it, but it was like each issue was like, we're going to have Jim Lee draw the Riddler. We're going to have Jim Lee draw like Poison Ivy. We're going to have Jim Lee draw Night, Night, his Nightwing is so good good like jim lee and he only drew him for like like that part of that issue but i would i would kill to see jim lee draw a nightwing like arc like yeah because he's always been one of my favorites too that character so uh yeah I, I like seeing nightwing done really well it's cool yeah so i don't know what else uh have we exhausted everything about this issue already <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah there's a, it opens up a lot of questions like these these two villains that rorschach breaks out are these were they in the original watchmen you know, I don't recall offhand, so I'm, I'm not entirely positive, but I have to say what's really funny with Mime, there's that page where he's miming his weapons, mm -hmm. right? And again, I was reading this at two o'clock last night, and I was staring at that page, and I was like, what is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> and then finally it clicked. I'm like, oh, that's clever. Uh, and, and it made sense. I like how Rorschach's like, you have problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is funny. Yeah. I suppose one thing I, I would ask you, I'd love to get your take, uh, really just, even as just a fan, like what, I mean, what hopes do you have for this? I mean, as far as, you know, this idea that some force has been manipulating the DC universe and DC continuity, it's like, is there anything that you hope comes out of this? Um, I just, as a fan, I just want to see the DC characters shine at the end. You know what I mean? Like I, I want it to be like Superman being really super and like you know like i just want the dc character i want this to be a good way for like the justice league and the dc heroes to like really like show why they're so important and why we as people still love these characters so much you know because i feel like it's really easy to 
be cynical today, you know, and like, like you said at the beginning, all the, the, the tragedy things that are, they're talking about in the news article, it's a lot of it hits close to home, you know? And like, mm-hmm. if you watch the news today, it's pretty much just negative story after negative story after just depressing stuff, constantly bombarding against you. And like, I feel like now more than ever, people need these kind of like superhero stories to, to like illustrate that, like, no, we can still be good people. You know, you don't have to give in to these, like to all the negativity around you, you know? And I, I really hope that's what Jeff's going for. Cause I mean, he always does stuff like that. So I'm like, I don't see why, like, I mean, I, I would, I would guess he wouldn't all of a sudden take a dark turn, but, um, but I definitely trust in whatever he's going to do. Cause he's like such a great writer. And like I said, he's my favorite writer, like ever. So I can't wait to see what he does with it. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm definitely intrigued. Like I said, this, it was, I guess it was different than what I was expecting. Not that I really had a ton of expectations going in because they did shroud a lot of this in secrecy and I didn't really know what it was going to be about necessarily. But um, yeah, I was a little a little bit surprised by, again, how direct of a sequel to Watchmen it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I was it, shocked about that too because I thought it was going to be the opposite. I thought it was going to be mostly DC and then Rorschach was going to pop them in the last page. Like I didn't think it was going to be... The other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's funny. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I I mean, continuity-wise, I guess, if the end result is that all of these stories, all of these timelines happened, and there's some way to kind of reconcile everything, which Jeff Johns excels at. I mean, mm-hmm. you just look at Hawkman to, you know, see how yeah. he did that. Um, I'd be happy with that. But ultimately, the whole continuity of it all is, is really secondary to me. I mean, I really just want this to be a great story that stands on its own. Mm-hmm. and I feel like something like, because, you know, what we shared about our feelings towards Watchmen, uh, as much as so many people love it, I, I know there are others out there who feel the way we do, and I feel like a series like this might be a little bit more accessible. Mm-hmm. Totally, to those characters. You know, to yeah. those characters in that universe. So, yeah. you know, ultimately, yeah, I mean, I'm really just hoping for a really strong story that that stands on its own, and, and that features Superman very prominently. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, continuity to me doesn't really matter all that much. I know people get tied up about it, and and, and as you should, because you, you invest your time and your money into it and stuff, but if you read comics for any longer than 10 years, like, stuff starts, con- even if they don't reboot, like, stuff just starts contradicting itself, because, like, the characters can't perpetually be 30 at all, you know what I mean? Like, right. for the rest of the, but at the same time, you don't, I don't want the characters to be older than 30. You know what I mean? Like, I don't like, I think that's, what's so great about comics is that like, why this, this kind of, this can, I'm going to loop this back to doomsday clock. So I'm going to go off on tangent. But I'm going to loop it back. Why I think these characters are so endearing an aspect of it is that as a kid, and this is just my personal take on it, but as a kid, the high number on books, like the, like four seventy eight or whatever, to me, that wasn't a deterrent at all. Um, why these characters have re- remained so important to people, and I think this is a big part of it, is that the um, like when I was a kid, I could have, I knew there was more to the character's past, and there's going to be more to the character's future, and there was this limitless amount of like possibilities to these characters so it was like as a kid i could make up my own stories with my action figures and they could all be technically quote-unquote canon and like as a, like and i could play in the backyard with my friends like pretending to be these superheroes you know running around the backyard and everything and like there's this limitless possibility to them and when you have stories that are beginning middle and end and finite you don't have that like as a kid like when i'd watch a movie i'd hate when characters would die because like there would be no further adventures of it and the characters kind of have to be this perpetual middle act to sustain that imagination. And so like, so, so, so to me, looping it back to the doomsday clock is now we're kind of expanding the Watchmen to be to this point where they're no longer finite. And who knows, maybe kids will be like, Oh, like all these stories I can make up as fun. I know that goes against a lot of like what people think about like, story and stuff but i think comics are unique in that sense that they're not just stories they're they're characters and i feel like the character in my opinion is always more important than the plot because the character is why you like you 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 collect the character you don't collect the plot you know what i mean so um 
that may not that may have made absolutely no sense to most people that I just said, but I kind of went on this rambling tangent. No, I'm, you know, I agree 100 percent about the, the high issue number because I know it's it's been trendy, especially at Marvel, at least up until recently, to regularly relaunch with new number ones. But mm-hmm. I feel like it's harder that way because especially if you know that there are all of these relaunches, it's like you don't always know. Like if you want to go back and read what came before, it's like you you don't even know how many series there have been or where to start. But it's yeah. like if there's been one series with even six hundred issues, it's like mm-hmm. okay, like at least I can I can track it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and especially what Marvel's doing because they're not rebooting every time. It's not like a clean start. It's like the new Spider Man number one comes off of whatever Spider Man right. thirty or whatever. You know what I mean? So yeah, as a kid, I was never shocked by the the high numbers i actually think that's more adults who don't like the high numbers i think it's the adult collector that's like oh i can't go but but kid i i didn't care as a kid did you care like no i didn't care yeah yeah so all right well i think that'll do it for us is there anything else that you wanted to say about doomsday clock number one I just thanks for having me. <laughs> Let me uh, talk about it with you. No, thank you so much. It was great to. Uh, this was fun. Like it was. It was great to you know get the issue and be able to chat about it. I hope that listeners enjoyed our conversation as well. Uh, and speaking of the listeners, so this episode is out on the same day as the My Comic Shop History season three finale. So if you haven't listened to the season finale of My Comic Shop History, that's available right now too. Be sure to give that a listen. Uh, Ken and I are going to keep talking, and you can hear that conversation in one week in the season finale of Flat Squirrel Tales. So Ken, thank you again so much for being part of this. Oh, thank you so much. And to the listeners, I'll see you next week. Awesome. Thank you to everyone for listening. And as far as my comic shop book club goes, uh, keep an eye and ear out for future installments of the book club. And be sure to follow along on the Facebook page, uh, My Comic Shop History, and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Desi Westside. I'll be sure to uh, post in advance what our next selection will be so you can uh, read it and follow along if you'd like. And until next time, keep your expectations low and you'll never be disappointed. Disappointed.